So Eric asked if this was test and specific. This will not be test and specific, which is hard for me to do because I love test and. <laughs> um, but I wanted to take an approach from from the perspective of what makes a good test executive in general. Um, what are they? How are they used? So things like that. And it is the top of the hour. Hey, Quentin. Q. Uh, top of the hour. So we'll get started. Looks like we got about 20 people in here. Uh, I don't know why my camera doesn't work on my laptop. So you guys don't get to see me, which is actually to your benefit. Um, so I'm Sam Roundy. For those of you that don't know me, uh, I work with Q. Uh, we we um, do a lot of integration, a lot of test stand, a lot of lab view stuff, a lot of cool stuff. Um, I've been doing this for about, I don't know, like what, 17 years. I've been in the test and measurement world. Um, and I am a LabVIEW champion. I am a certified test and architect. I'm a certified test and architect, LabVIEW architect. Um, and I helped, uh, I wrote part of the uh, certified test and developer exam, the current one, the one that everyone hates, the non multiple choice one. So you can, you can get mad at me for that. Um, this presentation is on test executives. It's a very, I want it to be more of a, a discussion and less of a presentation. Uh, thanks, Tim. Um, so more of a, more of a discussion. So I don't know if you guys are allowed to unmute your microphones. So if you do have something to say, feel free to, to hop in and interrupt. Um, I, I think that uh, this is an interesting topic um, because everyone has their own opinion about what a test executive is and uh, if you should write your own or not. And I'm my goal is to not try and persuade you one way or the other, although I probably kind of will. Um, okay, so Sri, you're saying they have to ask to share audio and video for that? And I only need to allow them. That's fine. If somebody has something that's saying they don't want to type it in the chat, I'm monitoring the chat, so I can I can view it there. Um, and if you, if you do want to say something, just raise your hand, and hopefully I'll see where that is, and I can let you in. Um, but yeah, I want I want this to be more of a discussion, and and yeah, I will show you some data and some numbers, and how at one uh, company we arrived at using an, an out, of, out of the, you know, an off the shelf test executive. Um, but outside of that, my goal is not really to try and persuade you one way or the other. Um, just a general discussion with a lot of information. So first things first, uh, our giants are female. Uh, if you don't know Megan Smith, I was first introduced to her when I saw the show um, General Magic. I was very fascinated by that uh, documentary. If you haven't seen it, I would go watch it. It's about one of the greatest companies that never succeeded. Um, and she graduated from MIT. She had a big impact on some of the stuff that General Magic did. She later became the CTO of the US. Uh, did not know they had one until I saw that show. She was a VP at Google and she is the CEO of Planet Out. She also did a lot of other things. Um, anyways, moving on. So here's kind of the agenda that I want to follow. Uh, I want to talk about some non-test requirements, uh, talk about what a test executive is, look at some of the components of a test executive, um, whether those components are great or not, um, look at COTS versus in-house and do kind of a cost analysis on that. So again, any comments? I'll be watching the chat. Um, and then I do have a poll that we're going to get to later. Uh, if you want to go take it, you can. 
um, but we'll we'll get to it later, or at least we'll we'll look at it later. So, um, so the first question: Have you used a test executive before? If so, which one? I'll give you a few minutes to answer. Test and custom one. Okay. Custom. So on those people who use both test and and a custom one, uh, what do you prefer and why? Okay, that's a good point. That's what I mostly see when people do prefer a custom one, Daniel. Yeah. There's a there's definitely a lot of opinions. Reduced complexity. I you feel like uh, because test stand or, or an off the shelf one might be so uh, feature rich that you can reduce that complexity down when you do a custom one. Is that what you're talking about, Eric? Yeah, Derek, I've seen that before too. How many features of Word don't you use? Oh, canoe, I've never even heard of those. I might have to check those out. Okay, we'll get into that station license a little later because that's an interesting one too. Um, yeah, that it's very interesting to me. I understand the concern and um, we'll get into that a little later because because that certainly is, is a factor. Um, so usually when we're given requirements to test a unit under test or a dot, um, we're given the requirements specific to that UUT. Like here's the operating behavior, um, here's the limits that you need to, to check against, right? Like uh, it needs to have this much um, gain, uh, you know, no sp this limited on how much spurious emissions there are if you're testing RF stuff. Um, and so we, we're given a lot of that stuff, but that's specific to the UUT. And then we look at those non-UUT requirements. A lot of the times, the things that we just forget to think about, or sometimes we don't think about until we're actually in the middle of the project. Um, these are the requirements that the customer or that uh, if you're working in a large company that they don't really tend to, to give you. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, it, it depends. And so like where and how to store the data, um, what do you want the user experience to look like? What about the developer experience? Is that a consideration? If you're just kind of a one man shop or you're riding solo, then that may not be a, a concern because you can define your own developer experience. But if this is something that multiple developers are going to be using or going to be maintaining or working on, you have to think about that. Um, licensing, which we kind of touched on, we'll touch on later. That's a big consideration. Um, installation and deployment. How do you get it from your source code onto a deployed machine? Is that even a necessary step? I've seen where some companies are okay just running out of the de development environment. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other requirements that are non-UUT related. Um, and in my mind, those are what make up the test executive. And those are things that the test executive should handle, like user management. Um, it's, it's the things that are gonna be reused on multiple test stations um, that don't contribute to the actual UUT itself, um, but contribute to a lot of the process that goes behind testing the UUT. Um, 
Any questions or comments on that before I move on? Okay. So how would you define a test ex executive? Do you agree with my assessment on the previous slide? Do you disagree? If so, why? Um, let's, let's see. I'll give you a couple minutes to type in the chat there. Or are there things that I'm missing as well? Well, there's a lot of things that I was missing in that slide, but Mr. Stephen Steph. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, we'll, we'll get to a lot of that too, so for sure. Results management, yeah, sweet. Totally agree. Um, so if we look at the components of a test executive, the, the non-UUT specific, you know, requirements that we talked about in the previous couple slides. Um, the first thing that pops out in my mind is you have this framework, which we're gonna talk a little bit more about. This framework is really what is bringing all of these components together, really managing how all of these components communicate with each other and, and how they are part of the system. Um, you have test flow. You have data storage, you have report generation, you have user management, you have settings, you have pass fail analysis, user interface, editor, early exit. I mean, a, a good test executive will really handle that, that early exit if there's a failure or an error um, in how that early exit performs. That should be something that's common between a lot of your test stations, the actual execution um, sequencing, which uh, you pointed out there, Derek. Um, tools, uh, for example, analyzing your code before you execute it. Um, configuration, uh, multi-threading. There's just many, many more components of a test executive. And you can have a super uh, feature-rich test executive with thousands and thousands of components. And that's what somebody said earlier in the chat is, is I want, uh, I want control of my test executive, which is why I use a custom one. And I want it to be super simple. Um, so Derek, I'm curious, <laughs> UI as part of the test is one of my historical pain points with testing. Can you expound on that a little bit? If you want to unmute yourself, you are welcome to. I... Cause I'm curious what you mean by that. Oh, yeah, that's true. Uh, I have another presentation later today that simplifies um, creating UIs in test stand, but I totally agree with you. The UI in test stand is, is a pain point um, if you haven't done it before, if you don't know, if you don't understand it, um, things like that. Uh, yes, thank you for pointing that out, Luis adapters, which I don't have on here, which I kind of consider part of the sequencing, although it's a lot more than that. Um, the adapters are a huge part of a test executive. The adapters allow you to call third-party code, um, things like LabVIEW, C Sharp, Python, C++, HT Basic, which I still don't understand why that one's still in there, although I think they removed it in 2020. Um, but yeah, the, that ability sometimes is uh, lacking in a lot of, uh, certainly a lot of the custom, uh, a lot of the custom test executives. Um, and I know that uh, 
that Testan handles more languages than any other test executive that I'm aware of. Again, not trying to sway you that way, but that's something that you want might want to consider when you're deciding on a test executive is what kind of languages can you call? Now, a good one should be able to call, um, a, a good one should be call, should be able to call uh, any language because you might not know what developers want to develop in and maybe you want to allow Python developers in your organization or C sharp developers and so on. Um, however, I've heard the argument from a lot of LabVIEW developers that, you know, LabVIEW can call any of those languages just as easily. You just have to know how to do it. Um, so, so if you do have a custom, uh, a custom test executive, um, and you do have kind of a plug-in type ability with just LabVIEW code, LabVIEW can call all of those. You just have to know how to do it. So um, there's that. The nice thing about an off-the-shelf one like TestAnd is you don't have to know LabVIEW at all, and you can use C-sharp. In fact, I've, I have several customers who just use C-sharp and TestAnd. They don't even really know what LabVIEW is let alone want to use it. So that's very common. Um, yep, that's true. Great point, Jasper. Thank you. So I wanted to kind of focus or hyper focus on some of the main components aside from the adapters. I didn't really want to get too much into it to the adapters, only for the argument that you can call other adapters from other languages. Um, so I wanted to hyper focus on several of these uh, common components. Um, these are just a few of many components. At a bare minimum, in my mind, a test executive should have most of these. Um, and a great test executive allows for customization of these. And we'll talk about that a, a little bit as well. Um, so the first one here is the framework. Um, a good test executive will have a nice framework that is really uh, bringing, a, that, that's kind of your design pattern for the LabVIEW developers out there. It's your architecture. It's what is the glue that brings all of these components together so that they can talk to each other. Um, the, the framework, a good framework will have an API. It will allow you to call into it from anywhere and anything so that you can have a lot of control over what's happening inside of that engine, sometimes they call it, or that framework. Um, and and so, so there's that aspect to it. Um, the, the second component or the second, yeah, major component that I wanted to look at is the editor. Um, I know a lot of people who make um, custom test executives. And then what happens is they have to share that test executive with other programmers, but they haven't really given a good way to edit or or change the code inside of there. And so th they're playing catch up a lot of times where they're like, well, you got to know LabVIEW and you got to do it this way and that way. And if we're using actor framework, then you got to know actor and you got to come and add an actor here. You got to know how to edit the actors and then rebuild everything and then do all of this. Um, a good editor really allows you to make scripts easily and quickly. And it should be, in my opinion, disconnected from the application itself in such a way that um, you can place, you can you can edit those scripts without touching any other pieces of the framework really, or of the test executive. Um, and so, so that would be my only suggestion if you're creating your own out of the box, you know, test executive is, is pay attention to those kinds of things. Um, I'm just reading Jesper's comment here, lies in the test code or in the higher mileage. Yes, agreed. Um, so the user interface, which sometimes is the editor and can be the editor, um, it allows the end user or the user who's performing the test um, to execute the test. A really good one will have debug capabilities built into it. A really good user interface will have a lot of um, feedback for the user so that they can see what's going on in the test so that they can um, 
so that and and a really really good one will have like different levels of user interface where you have a very simplistic view for um maybe just a tester who's just performing the test who's pushing a button walking away coming back or to a, a fully advanced one where you can actually debug the unit itself inside of the user interface um, we have a a tool that we use called task um, and and we've uh, it's built in actor framework and it also has a test and ui built into it um, we can actually pause it jump over to uh, instrument guis we call them um, sub guis and we can have full control over the whole test system from these manual guis and then jump back into testing and continue executing um, and so so a good user interface will a really really good one will have a lot of that functionality as part of it um, yeah we can get into that debate in a minute with the uh, <laughs> with, with the licensing um, User management, uh, although this one I don't think is as necessary as anything else on this list, it is something to consider and it's a lot, sometimes depending on, you know, the different levels of privileges that you need, um, it's something that you might need to consider. Like if you have advanced settings or advanced tools and you want to lock those out to just the common user, um, you'll need some kind of user management in, in your test executive. It allows you to change settings or configure things. Um, so a really, really good uh, user management system will plug into a company's or a corporate's, um, their, their user database. And um, so you can actually pull um, credentials from the uh, corporate database. Um, I've had to do that on several occasions for customers. It's, it's a, uh, it's, it makes life a lot easier because then you don't have to manage those users. The company does that for you. So, <laughs> so there's that. Um, test flow. This is different than the sequencing, although some people might argue they're the same. In my opinion, the test flow is a little higher level than just the sequencing. It's kind of the, the part of the execution that does all of the stuff that you want to happen for every test. Um, so, so this is how I differentiate the test flow from the sequencing is the test flow will do things like serial number entry, part number entry. It will do a lot of the data storage, a lot of the report generation, things like that. Um, and so it, it contains that high level flow. Um, a really good one will do uh, multi-threading or batching. Um, so, and a lot of times, in my opinion, when custom uh, test executives hit the wall is when they hit that test flow wall and, and they can't and they have to refactor to build in uh, that uh, parallel or that batch type testing into their custom test executive and that's where they hit that wall and then all of a sudden it's like well crap we didn't think people would want to do all of this um, when we built it and so now we got to go refactor and do this and that um, so, so that's that's kind of how I differentiate test flow from sequencing, which sequencing is specific to your dot. It's it's the ability to step through um, things that are specific to your UUT. They're specific to your dot. It's the and and in my opinion, it should be separated from your test flow. A really good test executive will will separate those out. It will pull that sequencing out so that you can plug in different sequences or different types of sequencing um, into your test executive, whether that's a state machine, uh, if you're doing a custom test executive, like that, that ability to, to have a plug-in architecture where you can plug in that, that state machine or whatever it is without touching the rest of your architecture and without rebuilding your test flow. That would be the ideal candidate, in my opinion, for, for that. Um, the, Second to last one here is the pass fail criteria. Uh, I debate uh, with a lot of people on this one. Um, <laughs> to, in my mind, it makes sense for your test executive to handle the pass fail criteria to uh, perform the the limit um, the, the limit analysis. Um, a lot of people like to push that into their actual UUT specific 
code or their code modules or the actual lab view code that's that's performing the the functionality or the algorithm or whatever the test um, and in my opinion uh, if you push that back into the test executive you have it generic enough they don't have to rebuild that um, that conditional type uh, functionality or algorithmic stuff every single time they want to add something to your test system um, and so that's why i feel like it belongs in the test executive and it, it's a big part of the test executive um yes i agree with that john <laughs> the last piece which is why we do testing uh, is to collect results uh, i mean i guess is to determine if the ut passes or fails first and foremost. And then lastly, to store results, um, whether that's in a, a flat file report or a database. Um, and, and in my opinion, um, this data storage component of a test executive, it needs to be super, super flexible in a way that you can, you can change what that output looks like without touching the rest of the system. Um, for some weird reason, uh, a lot of people uh, like their reports in Excel. I think Excel is a poor way to store data. Personally, uh, I prefer a database and then you can push it into Excel to do your analysis. Um, but if you don't have that ability to plug in different types of report generation into your test executive, um, you have to go refactor or recompile whatever that is. Um, and for those of you who have used test and before 2012, uh, it was a major pain to do this because you had to go into the process model, edit the process model, add all of your result, you know, logging steps into the woven throughout the process model. And that's kind of how I view a test executive that doesn't allow kind of a plug-in type uh, environment with that data storage, that's that, uh, that uh, result gener, uh, I guess, pushing out to, to disk. Um, one thing I will say about this, there's really two parts to data storage. There's the data collection, and then there's the uh, result, uh, what do they call it? Re the, the pushing the, the data out to the, the reports or the database, right? So, yeah, I get that. But I don't like Excel as a main major storage. And I want to go back to um, Tim's comment. Tim, that's a very good point. Anything you have to do with every step should be in an executive. And I totally agree with that. Um, very good point. Um, yeah, any step versus every step. Yeah. Okay. Any, any, uh, comments or questions? What did I miss in this list that you think every test executive should have as a component? I agree with you. Plugin architecture. Okay. That would be the first, the framework type thing, right? Is that creating this ability to plug in any component as long as that component follows the component rules? Um, gauge R and R. So you're talking about Francois, um, clarify for me, because I know gauge R and R is like repeatability. I, I don't remember what the other R stands for. Reproducibility, that's right. And you think that should be built into the test executive? I would agree with you <laughs> to some extent. <laughs> Integration tests of written sequences. Not sure what you mean by that. Well, 
Prologent. I have not used Prologent. I've heard of it. Scalability. Yes, I would agree with the scalability, David. And as long as your um, your framework is built properly, that engine that holds everything together, it should make it super scalable. Um, so yeah. Okay. Okay, we can debate on gauge R and R all day long, uh, but we don't need to. So, self-test features, sequence checkers. I like that, Alexander. I think those are important. I don't think they're absolutely necessary. Um, but yes, there's a ton of components that you can have in your test executive. So let's talk about COTS. And when I say COTS, I mean commercial off the shelf. For those of you that aren't familiar with that term, it means that something you can go purchase that's all ready to go out of the box, basically. You might have to customize a few things versus in-house. Um, here is my list um, of what I kind of consider the advantages of COTS versus the advantages of in-house. Um, so COTS, I think that uh, somebody mentioned this in the comments earlier, it's proven. There's like thousands of users with it, with a good COTS, you know, a widely adopted COTS solution. Um, it's in some cases an industry standard. You can go out and say, hey, I want to hire somebody with a certification that knows this, um, that's familiar with this, you know, framework, this test executive, it's really higher hard to hire somebody who's familiar with, you know, Bob over in Lab 121's test built in-house test executive. Um, that you have to hire them and train them up and have Bob over in Lab 121, you know, mentor them. So uh, a good, the other advantage is it's well documented generally. I'm not saying a, an in-house test executive can't be well documented. It's just, I've never seen it. I'm sorry, I have not seen a good, well-documented in-house test executive. Um, there's a lot of support maintenance out there. Um, Daniel, yours is the first. <laughs> uh, less staff needed. Uh, the reason I say less staff needed is because now you don't have people dedicated to just maintaining this test executive, which can actually cost quite a bit of money. Um, the other nice thing about COTS is it's feature rich. Um, you're going to get features that you potentially may not want to create. Um, sometimes you're forced to create them. For example, you might purchase an off the shelf test executive that has user management already built into it. And you may not create that in your in-house test executive just because it might take too much time or whatever. And so you would be willing to go without. But if you bought a COTS one, it has that feature already, you might use it because it's there. Um, and it's ready today. I don't have to wait six months for you to create an in-house test executive, which is why I prefer a COTS one, it's ready to use today. Um, I built a whole career around maintaining our test executive. I am sorry, John unless you love doing that. <laughs> That's another uh, good point. Um, some people, I see people get sucked down into that hole um, <laughs> I, of, cre of maintaining in-house test executives. And uh, one of the problems I see with that is sometimes they're the only ones that know the ins and outs of that in-house test executive and they're the only ones that can make changes and update it. And they get locked into that position. They, they don't have really room for growth within the company because it's like, we can't move you up the chain. Yeah, it's job security, but it's sucky job security in my opinion, um, because you're kind of stuck there. Um, and in, in my opinion, you're, you're stuck there, right? You don't have the ability to move up the ladder, but yeah, you're, you have a job forever basically. And I guess you can hold the company, you know, a knife to the company's head, which I have actually seen people do 
and say, look, I'm the only person that can do this. You need to pay me a bunch of money. Um, and, and I've seen that. Um, so I, I digress. Anyways, different, different issue. In-house, the advantage of an in-house one, and I would love to hear from you guys if I've missed other uh, pros to the in-house test executive. The biggest one is the full control. You have access to all of the source code. You can do whatever the crap you want with it. It's exactly what you want. You don't have all of the extra bells and whistles, all the bloatware, um, all of that stuff built into it. <laughs> I like that, Mike. That's a good idea. Scaling, Eric. I'm I'm curious what you mean by 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 scaling. I see. Okay, so you start out small. You don't need that big system, and then you start to scale. Got it. Anything else that I may have missed on the in-house pros or even on the COTS pros? Yeah, I can see that, Derek. But that goes back to the full control, right? Limited to developer, author knowledge, or team knowledge. Yes. Maintenance costs. Yes, we haven't even talked about maintenance costs. Yes. Yeah, right. We'll get we'll get to that. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um but that's, I mean, that's really what it is, right? It's this ability to have all of that full control. I mean, I guess I could go to list all of the components and say, you have, you can do this with this component or that, with that component, which a COTS might not allow. Speed, no, let that say. Yep. Yeah. Oh, that's a good point, Mike. So with an in-house one, you, you do have that training cost. I mean, I guess you have a training cost with a COTS one too. Everyone needs to learn how to use the test executive at some point, whether depending on the role, right? If they're a developer, they have to learn how to use it from a developer standpoint. If they're an operator or a tester, they have to learn how to use it from a tester um standpoint and so that that training cost in my opinion is kind of a wash or could be the only advantage i would say with the cots is that sometimes the cot solutions might have an an offering a training offering with a manual and a whole bunch of you know well documented stuff whereas in in, in like forums and different things like that whereas an in-house one might not um have that um, and so it might take a little um, more time to come up to speed with the in-house one only because you have to sometimes reverse engineer things because it may not be super well documented or it may not be in a manual. Um, so yeah, real good points. All right, let's move on. So cuts gives commonality between test systems rather than having one, many one-off test stages. That is true. Um, but that's Q, I think, assuming that um, people are going to rebuild, or reinvent the wheel every test machine. I hope that's not the case. I hope if they use an in-house test executive, it will accomplish the same goal of providing a similar user experience for every test station. Um, you could also have somebody familiar with the COTS come in. Yes, that is a good point, Tim. And that's what I was saying with this. Uh, Nope, I didn't put it in my list. I thought, oh, yeah, hire someone who knows it. That's what I was saying there, but totally agree. Great point. Um, so I kind of did a, this is, this is me trying to say what it would cost for me to build a super, super simple test executive from the ground up. Maybe not super simple, maybe a, a little complex. Um, from the ground up in man hours. Um, and so I kind of like said, if I had to build my framework and my sequencing, the ability to do sequencing, my test flow, all of this stuff, what would that really look like 
versus a COTS one. Um, so, so my best estimate, and this doesn't include the training, which probably is needs to be included because that's going to also cost some some money here too or some time here. Um, but let's just assume that it's like, you know, typical NI forty hours of training which we all know that NI training doesn't give you what you really need to do the job. But um, let's assume that it's it's another 40 hours. So really your total COTS is, let's say 110, 120. Um, and then you also, but if you're developing from scratch, um, let's assume you're just developing your own test executive, it's around six, 700 hours. That's almost a 10X difference. Um, and this is totally me coming up with this. Um, we'll look at what NI thinks in a minute with test stand. Um, this doesn't include the maintenance costs, which I think are actually the, the larger part of what's really going on here. Um, and it doesn't include other major components. Um, and so if you want like high multi-threading capabilities, or you want um, any other like major components, you have to, you would have to add to this list. Um, and again, this is kind of, in my opinion, the bare minimum for a good test executive that's going to be used by a multi, uh, multi-member team. Um, Ginflow support case with batch. Okay. Um, so that's me. NI has a website with a worksheet that you can go calculate all of this. Um, this is a screenshot from there. Um, they're saying, this is what a test system would cost if you built it versus bought it. Um, this is the difference. I think, I wanna say this is over the, oh, they say the lifetime of a system and they have some way that's saying a lifetime of a system is X amount of years or whatever. Um, and I think this is for 10 developers, I wanna say, if I remember right, because you have the, the training cost, um, or maybe it's 50, maybe it's 50 developers. I don't remember. Anyways, any thoughts or comments on this? So I'm gonna click on this link. Hopefully it'll work without jacking up my oh, lovely edge. Um, for somehow edge got set as my default. I need to go change that. Um, so here's what that here's what that link looks like. They talk about the role of a test executive, um, typical test executive functionality, um, the cost breakdown, and they talk about like. Hey, if you're gonna, they're, in my opinion, their estimates are super high. Um, and that's a really good point, James. Um, there's assuming a hundred man days. These are in days to create, you know, your developing and development environment, 40 days to do a custom OI. That seems super high to me. Um, I think if you were to just do all of this in like actor framework, you could do it a lot. Um, a lot faster. Uh, I guess it depends on your experience too, right? So there's that to take into consideration. Um, how about one developer for in-house? Yeah, I don't know what that looks like, John. I haven't ran the numbers on one, um, so I don't know what that'll look like. Um, but yeah, it goes down and it, it analyzes all of that. And eventually they arrive at, you know, this total cost of life you know, of a system. But I, I th was thinking they used to have where you could kind of fill this out yourself. I don't see that anymore um, at this website. I haven't been on this website for a while. So um, it's biased on how much and that is true. True and true, Daniel both great points. Um, 
I think to your point, Daniel, and this is where I want to have this discussion is the licensing thing, right? Because with test stand, <laughs> it isn't a nice suspect. <laughs> uh, with test stand, <laughs> you, you have to pay for a license for every test station. And this is because of some royalty for some uh, DLL or something that they're pulling into the, I want to say either the test stand engine or some part of test stand. Um, and so because of that, uh, you have to pay that for every test station. Now, the, the good thing about that is those deployment licenses are good for life meaning you can use them on any version of test stand from now until forever at least that's what ni claims um and, it, and so far it's proven true um and so that so that's the good thing is once you buy a test stand deployment license it's good forever like you don't have to buy another one to upgrade to new versions of test stand um and the downside though is if you have like thousands of test stations that can get super, super pricey because you're paying what if you, you can buy them in like the packages of five to 10 or whatever, and you get them for like, I think around 300 and something dollars, um, that can, that can cost a lot of money. Right. Um, and then you also have to manage those licenses. Um, I was fortunate enough at one company to talk NI into putting test and deployment licenses on our uh, license server. So part of our, uh, enterprise agreement and that was really nice because we could put them in a pool and have any of our test stations log in i think we had around 500 test stations and i want to say we had 150 of these licenses and so we just had a pool and any of these test stations that logged in mostly we only ever had around 100 or 110 test stations that's kind of where it peaked is what i saw of grabbing these licenses so we got away with with having a pool of these licenses um i'm just reading derek's comment here inheritance to manual indeed it didn't need that net built-in db reporting step tracing yeah good explanation with thousands thousands of licenses yeah so it you have to take that into consideration. Um, and so even though you guys are joking, uh, Tim, that, that this is an NI thing after all, uh, it's, it's not really, although in my opinion, I've come to that conclusion that a COTS item is the best and that test stand is the best out there. Um, and I could be persuaded other ways, uh, I just haven't yet. <laughs> Let's just say that. Um, but ultimately, at the, the end of the day, you have to go decide which solution is the best for you. Is it a COTS? Is it an in-house? I can't tell you that. I think everybody's situation is different. I think everybody's, um, everybody's, you know, how every company runs differently um you have factors that you can't control like um this has to run on linux test and cannot run on linux um you, you know you have a lot of these things that are that are possibly outside of your control and so you have to determine that now i put up a poll i can't see i can't see the poll where did it go why can't I see the poll? Oh, there it is. Okay. It looks like we've got, so if you click on the little poll thing above the chat, um, you can vote. Let's, I'm curious to see where we're, where we're at in this room. It doesn't look like we have a lot of Keysight SL users, which I didn't expect. Did you guys even know Keysight had their own test executive? um other for those of you that answered other i'm curious what you're using i, I mean, somebody mentioned canoe canoe 
I think that's how you pronounce it. I don't know that I consider Veristand a test executive, although it is for real time, I guess. And Veristand is very different than test uh, than test stand. Um, oh, it, canoe is used for hardware in the loop stuff. I don't do a lot of hardware in the loop stuff, so I'm not familiar with with that industry as much. Um, canoe from Vector. It looks like we got a lot of Veristand and canoe stuff. I'm going to have to go look into this. Sounds interesting. One, we need two sequence. Yeah, so that's what I've seen, Mike. A lot of people will use Veristand to do the hardware in the loop, like kind of ex executive type stuff, and then they'll integrate that back into test stand and have test stand do the high level sequencing and stuff. Um, yeah, so. Great information. So I think we're over because we're only supposed to go for 45 minutes. So I am going to um, really quickly go through the conclusion here. Test executives, in my opinion, can be one of the most important softwares in your organization. I think that a good test executive that is used widely um, in, a, in a large organization can save the organization millions of dollars annually um, in test development times um, and in decision making. A lot of times, if you're starting from scratch every time, you spend a lot of time making decisions. If a good test executive has already made a lot of those decisions for you, and you're kind of, this is how the company does it, this is the test exec executive that we use, and all of these decisions are made for you, go. And then you only have to focus on the things specific to the UUT. Um, choose wisely. Uh, cost can be you know, a, a factor. There's a lot of things that contribute to cost. There's a lot of things that contribute to the decision that you make, um, in my opinion, in-house and from what I've seen will almost always be more expensive. That being said, I generally work with larger corporations who have hundreds of benches. Um, and so that's what I've seen. I've noticed on the chat that a couple of people have mentioned, it'd be nice to have an open source one. I totally agree. I don't know that it's out there and, um, Test executives, um, even no matter which way you go, I really, really encourage you to use one, uh, especially if you're maintaining more than five test benches, and especially if you have multiple developers contributing to those test benches. Um, never heard of OpenTap. That would be an interesting, I'll have to look into that. Um, so, so that's the conclusion. Um, thanks for your time. If you have any questions, you can message me. Um, I'm always up for a good uh, debate on test executives. Um, and everyone have a great day, and I hope you get some sleep. <laughs> See you guys.